in the chair, and the lady showed me her book. And I said, hmm, there's no song reading, so I guess I'm not reading a song this week. Oh. Well, Well, it's showing live it is on showing. Facebook. Yep. It's showing what's actually. Yep, it's the, live on Facebook. Okay. See, look, there we are. Okay, so uh, the only thing I need to do is adjust as yep. it goes to whatever's going on. So there. maybe. So, Joyce, you can. <laughs> Thank you. 
rise with your people as we sing our open hymn. Lord, you get the great commission. celebration, and thank you to those who joined us at Smith's Chapel for the homecoming service at Simpson. It was a great time. The United Women in Faith's nut sale has been extended until 5 p.m. today to give those last-minute shoppers an opportunity. Please check out your bulletin for the link to the online sale. 
Next week, we celebrate Commitment Sunday as we offer our pledges to our 2023 budget. Check your bulletin for details about how to pledge. This Tuesday, Wesley Woods is having a fall bus ride around the camp, so you can marvel at the fall foliage. The bus leaves at 1 p.m. See your bulletin about how to save a seat for you on the bus. And now it's time for us to greet one another. Oh, wait. Okay. oh I was going to do that thing. Okay. okay. Yeah, I've, I've just got a couple uh, of announcements to share in. There we go. Did I manage to? That's an amazing trick. <laughs> Did I manage to do that? I have no idea. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, uh, just a couple of, of brief announcements. Um, first of all, I didn't get a chance to announce this last week in this service because we were at Simpson College and the different churches were not doing individual announcements. So I wanted to share with you the exciting news, if you have not already heard, that we have surpassed our goal for fundraising for the renovation of the sanctuary. Yay. Our goal is $90,000, and we are past $92,000 at this point. So uh, thank you so much for your giving. Uh, it allows us to make sure, boy, all the cash flow is ready to finish it. Uh, where we are is um, uh, the painting is done, the scaffolding is down, um, there's going to be, uh, in this next week or so, some config reconfiguration of the chancel area uh, to make it more accessible and usable uh, for our band and for choral groups and things like that. And then um, uh, we will be doing carpeting following that. So, uh, so it's moving right along. Uh, for those of you who used to count bubbles around the window during my sermon, if you got bored, there are no more bubbles, I'm sorry to say. It's just a nice, smooth, beautifully white coat paint. So uh, it looks good. So uh, we're, we're working that direction, and that's just exciting. The other is, uh, Myra briefly mentioned, um, we are in the process of collecting uh, pledges for the 2023 um, uh, church year. We do it this time of year so that our finance committee can produce a budget that's in line uh, with what people believe they can give. And I just want to say some, a couple of brief things about that. Next Sunday is our, our Consecration Sunday, and we ask if you've not already uh, given a pledge card to consider uh, bringing a pledge card with you that Sunday, and we'll have a special time for you to give it in the service. If that's too soon for you, if you're still figuring out what you can give, that's okay. You can still put the card in later, mail it in later. You can email Michael Boston at michael at imdfumc.org with your pledge. That all works. But it gives us an opportunity to kind of really kick off the collection of those cards. Now, you may think for possibly, oh, I don't give all that much. I don't really need to, to write that down. Actually, it's extremely helpful whether you are able to give a small amount or a giant amount or anything in between if you let the finance committee know uh, uh, what your gifts are going to be across the year. It, it's anonymous. They don't get your name, but they get the numbers, and it helps them produce an accurate budget. What, when we finish the, the, the new update to our even more gorgeous sanctuary, I'm sorry to say we still have to pay the gas bill, and we still have to pay the electric bill, and uh, staff, well, we kind of like to eat, and, uh, you know, things like that. There are still costs. So the costs of doing ministry are not nearly as exciting as a sanctuary upgrade, but what you give each and every year is vital to what we do. So thank you for pledging. Thank you for giving. I know a number of you have already sent in cards. Thank you for doing that. Um, it's, it's just part of that process that helps us be good stewards, know what we can do in the future, not spend money we don't have, things like that. So I uh, look forward to next Sunday as we consecrate our gifts to the Lord. We have one more announcement. First UMC will have its annual charge conference on November 6th at 3 p.m. Our charge conference will be held in conjunction with a total of 12 
congregations in our circuit here at First UMC's facilities. Anyone can attend the charge conference. Voting members of the conference are the members of the pastor, administrative council, and any retired UN clergy who are affiliated with First UMC. Our charge conference will be presided over by our new district superintendent, Ron Carlson. These are just some of the things that are happening here. Please see your bulletin for more, including information about our ongoing stewardship campaign. And now, would you please stand and greet each other with a handshake and welcome.
You may be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 92. Please join me in reading the bold look text as shown on the screen. Hear these words. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute in the heart, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. This has been the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reaching for my wireless mic button and I'm not wearing a wireless mic so while we're up here. It's uh, good to be in worship together and always a wonderful uh, opportunity to gather uh, when we have a baptism. Uh, today we're blessed to have the baptism of Estella Rose Probosco and uh, uh, her parents bring her, Jesse and Laura, and others who have come with, uh, with her to witness, that, to witness the baptism. Uh, if you all would come forward, and, and we'll share together in baptism. here with us today. Awesome. That's so great. Yeah. So as we share in baptism this morning, there'll be some uh, baptismal questions, vows, and they're going to be on our screens as we share together. And congregation, like you'll excuse me because I'm going to turn my back on you a little bit. I've not entirely memorized all of these. So, so as we'll share together. And um, Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given a new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without Christ. I present today Estella Rose Probasco for baptism. Her parents are Jesse and Laura Probasco. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so say I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord? in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, say that. Will you nurture Estella in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Do you as Christ's body, the church, Reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include this family now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround them with a the community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples 
who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the faith, the Christian faith as contained in the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. They see at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So the main ingredient in baptism is water. And uh, as we remember our own baptisms, we remember that water is a symbol of cleansing. Water is necessary to life. And so it is a great symbol for baptism. And I will put this mic over here because water and microphones don't go together. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of water as we use it today in Estella's baptism. Help us, Lord, to remember that it is through your gifts and your love and grace that you bless her this morning and bless her family. Come upon us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, this day, pouring out your Spirit among us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, what do you think? <laughs>
But uh, and I just used the one for our daughter to remember where on earth uh, and when it was we did the baptism. <laughs> so um, I'll usually whoever's not with the baby gets the other stuff. So and then and then um, we have uh, folks in our church who make quilts and uh, for, for uh, little ones that are being baptized, and so that's a gift from from our crafters in our church on some other day when it's a little little cooler than it is today. But uh, congratulations, and uh, so thankful that you gave us an opportunity to participate. change gears a little bit as we prepare to share uh, this morning from the gospel. Today I'm in Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter beginning at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Probably for many of you, a pretty familiar passage. It's a, a fairly well-used passage. But I thought today it was a good opportunity, since we were sharing in the sacrament of baptism this morning, to talk about and focus a little bit on baptism, why we baptize, what it means to us, uh, what it, it, you know, the purpose it serves in the church and, and in families and, and people's lives. Uh, you'll notice the, the context of the scripture is that Jesus is getting ready to ascend to heaven, and he's kind of giving, for want of a better word, final launch instructions before he takes off and leaves the church to try to do its ministry. And you'll notice he has some action words in this, in this uh, little uh, scripture to tell us things we should be about. The first thing he starts with is go. Go. I know a few years ago, and I know they were following the Common English uh, Bible, uh, but one of one of our abortive attempts to have a general conference, the the, uh, the the theme of general conference was therefore go. Now I know it's a good translation; it works either way. But I like having the word go first myself, just because I like the emphasis on on go. Part of the purpose of the church is to share the love of God to share Jesus, to go out from our own building and our own uh, group of people and, and be people who share the love of God. And so, um, yes, for a time, the disciples were then in Acts, uh, Luke and Acts, you know, was told to hang out in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came, but that was only for 50 days. And then they were to go, and the disciples went all over the world sharing God's love. Go. All, to all nations, make disciples, make disciples. Now, I don't know how much you might have thought about this, but a disciple is not necessarily synonymous with a member. One of the things about the church is that we, we often talk about membership, and church membership is a good thing. I'm not speaking, obviously, against church membership, but Membership in a lot of organizations can mean not much. I mean, you, you send in your dues and you're a member and, and that's it. Really, Christians talk, are supposed to talk more about being a disciple of Jesus. What's the difference? Well, the disciple is one who follows a teacher, a rabbi, a leader. And as such, you're supposed to then go where they go and try to do what they do. And so... 
membership is valuable, but membership needs to blossom into discipleship for it to really have its fullest, fullest meaning. You can be a disciple of Jesus Christ without being a member of an of a official local congregation, but you can also be a member of a local congregation and not really be a disciple. Uh, it's really about a desire to try to follow Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that any of us do that perfectly. We all stumble, we all fail, we all make mistakes, we do better some days than others, but so did the original apostles, too. You read plenty of the Gospels about uh, their failings, their mistakes, their misunderstandings. <laughs> And um, so it's not about being perfect, it's about trying to follow God. Go in the world, make disciples, baptize them. Baptize them. Often, when I baptize a little one, they look at me a little quizzical. What on earth do you think you're doing? Putting water on me, I don't know you. Occasionally, a little one will even get kind of upset about it. I mean, this seems, seems like, I don't know why this is happening. And that's, that's something that, in baptism, is a little hard to communicate. You see, the person who's receiving the baptism often doesn't yet understand baptism. It's those around them that are bringing them to the font, knowing that they're doing so out of an act of love for this little one, an act of commitment, uh, uh, wanting them to be uh, baptized in the faith, and they understand it long before the person being baptized does. Being a person who grew up in a tradition where, where you didn't get baptized till you were a little older, to be honest, at first it confused me. I thought, well, how does this work? Well, the good news is that God loving you and me is not connected to you and me actually understanding everything about God. By the way, that's a really good thing because I don't understand everything about God and if I couldn't be baptized so I understood everything about God, I'd still not be baptized. It's not about understanding, it's actually about receiving. You see, we have two sacraments in the church. We have baptism and Holy Communion. Holy Communion is a sacrament you can receive over and over again. Our church does it about once a month and some other days. Uh, some churches have communion every time they worship. Some ch churches do it less times than we do. There's not all that much said in the Bible uh, about how often, except actually our oldest roots in, in Methodism are that the early Methodist church preferred frequent communion or actually John Wesley called it constant communion over infrequent communion. And so if anybody ever wants to do communion more than once a month, just ask me, I'm more than happy to. I've been in churches where we did it more often than that. But that's a repeatable experience with God. What baptism is supposed to be is a once in a lifetime experience. Why once? Well, because in baptism, what we understand the scriptures tell us is that God, God fills us with grace and love and marks us with the seal of that baptism. And it's unnecessary to ever consider being baptized again. It's unnecessary, first of all, because God did it right the first time. So you don't need it again. God did it right. God loves you. God has welcomed you into God's family. You are always welcome into God's family for, from that moment. Your baptism doesn't go away. I'm thinking about children and walls for some reason when I do baptism. I don't know. It's more like a permanent marker than washable Crayolas. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't come off. It doesn't come off. So you don't need to be baptized again. Now, sometimes Christians who are already baptized will get together and reaffirm their baptism with phrases like, remember your baptism and be thankful, or remember that you are baptized and be thankful. But you don't, you don't need to be baptized again because from your baptism and even before your baptism, God already loves you and cares about you and, and continues to love you forever. So, so there's not a need to repeat. So what is it we're all doing in baptism? Well, first of all, as I said, God's giving a blessing of God's eternal love in that person's life. 
The other is, is that those of us who gather around someone who is being baptized often come as sponsors. We have parents, we have godparents or sponsors who come, and, and what they're saying is, we recognize that our child can't make these decisions for themselves at this point in their life, but we want to make sure their life starts out well, and that we make commitments on their behalf, just like you make commitments that your child's going to go to school when they're school age, that, that certain things are going to happen in their life. And, and you do all those things for a child out of love, whether it's clothing them, feeding them, educating them, training them, sometimes disciplining them because you love them. Now, the real truth is lots of times the child will not understand that until they're quite a bit older. Until they're quite a bit older. I've had several people tell me that they've noticed their parents got smarter and smarter the older they got. That things that they thought, well, I just know it, the parents didn't, they didn't think their parents got. They realized later, no, their parents did understand and there was an ex experiential thing going on here that, that affected how, how they did things. And so parents, family, sponsors, godparents, grandparents, others, are saying, hey, we, we're committed to this child, we're committed to their future, we're committed to their life, we're committed to what happens to them, we want to see them have what God wants for them. And then, at a later date, we just started classes for this uh, just this last week, uh, at a later date, people choose to confirm their own faith. That's what confirmation is for. Uh, confirmands in our church are usually eighth graders, they get together, they learn about their faith, and then um, they, uh, uh, they t take some classes and things, yes, but a big part of it is learning and deciding, this has been mom and dad's faith, this has been grandparents' faith, aunts and uncles, friends' faith, but I'm deciding now this is my faith. And, and that commitment that comes with that. Now you notice it doesn't stop there. Go make disciples, and then teach. Teach. One of the reasons that we, we study the Bible on Sunday morning and share from the scriptures in worship, one of the reasons we have Sunday school classes, one of the reasons we have things like disciple Bible study, that we have Wednesday night studies that come along every once in a while, or, or like this Advent, I'll do an Advent study on Sunday evenings, is that we need to learn about our faith because God does want to teach us. Now that doesn't mean the faith is super complicated though. You would think it is. The way that Christians argue about individual little doctrines and fight over things like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or how much water you need for a baptism. That's not the basics of the faith. The creed that we shared, the Apostles Creed is one of the very basic statements that I really like that really says a lot about the faith. Sometimes people get confused by the word small word, small c Catholic, which means universal rather than a particular denomination. But it's a great statement to share what we believe. Another statement that comes out of our Wesleyan faith is, is the phrase, the phrases, do no harm, do good, Stay in love with God. I think the original was attend to the ordinances of God, but Bishop Job decided to stay in love with God was easier to understand. Do no harm, do good, love God. Now that's just really simple stuff. Do your best not to hurt other people, not to harm others, not to do the wrong thing, not to be a danger to others, not to, to be mean to others. I mean, you know, there's so many ways we can say do no harm. Do good, help people, love people, care about people, reach out to a world that hurts. And then in that, stay in love with God. Because one of the things that we believe in baptism that is so empowering to me is that God loved us before we ever did anything for God. There are branches of the Christian faith who give you the impression, I know they don't mean to, but they give the impression that you need to do enough, and then God will love you. 
And I think some Christians have that kind of idea that, well, if I just go to church enough, or if I just do enough good works, or if I just... The problem with that is, is God already loved you before you ever did a single thing. And if you're working out of I have to's like that, it stops being a blessing. Well, I guess I have to go to church today. I guess I have to teach a class. I guess I have to help with this need. I have to. But if your attitude and understanding is God already loves you and cares about you, you don't do it to earn God's love. Instead, just the opposite. Because God loves me and all of us, I get to serve meals to people who are hungry. I get to teach a class. I get to worship God. I'm blessed to be able to be a part of baptism and the sacraments and all that goes with it. To me, it just gives such a different feeling about our faith. One of the things that I think is so important to children is unconditional love. Unconditional love. I was a psychology major in college because I thought maybe it would help me figure out church people. It really hasn't worked, but, but I, I did take a lot of psychology. And one of the things that they did in psychology was they did experiments, and sometimes ones we wouldn't allow anymore. Like there, there was the whole idea that B.F. Skinner had of putting somebody in a box and, and not giving them any, uh, any contact and seeing how they turned out. Well, gee, how did that work? Not good. Because we also, we happen to know now, and we believe, and we actually, families know this forever, that children need love. They need to be touched. They need to be held. They need to be hugged. They need to be cared for to thrive. They need that to thrive. We all need that too. We need God's love. We need God's grace. We need to be cared for. And when people don't have that, there's some loss in their life. There's a missing piece that should be there. And to me, that I believe the scripture tells us is part of what the church is for. We are to be there for those who hurt. We are to be there for those who mourn. We are to be there for those who are lonely. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And so, from before the moment of our baptism, Christ loves us. Christ cares about us. Christ guides us. I'm so thankful today that we got to share in Estella Rose's baptism. Remember that you are baptized and be thankful. Lord, we thank you for the love that you give us this day. Bless us as we continue in worship. In Christ's name, amen. Now, what did I do with it? So we're going to, at this time, share in a hymn of reflection. Freely, freely. It's in our United Methodist hymnal, but it's also right there on the screen.
This time we're going to share together in praises and prayer concerns. Does anyone have a joy or a concern that you'd like to share today? Yes. Jim, um, Kathy Martin called me and asked me to share. Um, she had a bad fall a week ago. She was rather homebound now. Her broken bones, so that's not able to drive or her first. At least two weeks and maybe three. She asked for prayer. For those of you not been able, might not be able to hear, uh, Kathy Martin uh, took a fall and uh, is home. Uh, nothing broken, but but not 100% yet. Keep her in your prayers. Others. Yes. I think we should play, pray for Richard Clark. He's in prayer choir. He's Prayers for Richard Clark and, and health concerns this last week. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Let's uh, take time to go to the Lord in prayer today. Gracious God, we thank you for the needs that we have. And we pray that you would guide us as we pray for others. Be with those who are experiencing health needs those who have lost loved ones also be with our joys today lord in, in baptism and in new life fill us with your presence your grace and your spirit in christ's name amen this time our ushers will come as we share together in our office
gracious Lord, we thank you for these gifts that have been given in your name. Bless us in, in our giving. And as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing song. We all are one in mission. This worship we have had together bless us in our continued worship with you this week through prayer through service to others send us out in the name of a loving Christ amen, amen.